Good morning, good morning, good morning, for this is the day that the Lord has out of my comfort zone, but I declare today that God has shown himself mighty in my life, and whenever God speaks and lays something on my heart, at least I can try to fulfill what he has laid upon my heart. Here it is. This is for one of our members by the name of Dwight Eaton, and every time I hear him sing that song, I'm, I'm lifted, I'm, I'm blessed, I'm inspired. Is the husband of one of our own, Sister Pam Woody Eaton, who works so hard in this ministry, like so many others, and I'm grateful. But permit me to get this out of the way so I can move on and here now do what the Lord has laid upon my heart. Y'all pray for me. again to stand before the precious people of God, Second Baptist Church. I love you. Thank you for all of your prayers and your support and your phone calls over the last 10, 11 weeks since we have been in this uh, uh, situation. But I believe it's a situation that has been divinely inspired and ordered by God. And in, in as much as we analyze the situation, I want to submit to you today that God is very much in charge and in control of the situation. And so, my brothers and sisters, indulge me and pray for me today as we come again on this day. And I'm blessed and privileged, and I marvel at what I see God doing in this moment. I just want to just before I get to the text, uh, this this idea of a paradigm shift is all over me. And in as much as we have been meditating and pondering this paradigm shift uh, notion, uh, 
I have been overwhelmed and inundated with spiritual nuggets and insight as it relates to a paradigm shift. And what God has shown me is that it's going to be better in the latter than it was in the beginning. And I, I, I hold on to that. I'm inspired by that because all that has happened, I know unless the Lord wills for things to happen, it will not happen or it cannot happen unless the Lord has a reason and a purpose for allowing it to happen. And I'm clear today, I'm confident today that I'm standing on the promises of God. And so are you. Those of you who are listening, those of you who have joined us in this live stream, and those who are listening, teleconference, I'm so glad you're here. And all I ask is that you pray for this preacher, and God will do the rest. Uh, as I reflect back, and by way of review, I have... Uh, familiarize myself. I have remembered such messages already shared with the people of God at Second Baptist Church and all others who thought it not robbery to John. I thought about one of the messages that the Lord laid on my heart some weeks ago titled, Can You Hear Me Now? I must say, though, that been a good one. I've probably gotten more feedback off of that one than perhaps all of the others. But it's interesting that the question was raised, God, can you hear me now? I think the question is still resonating as we continue to move forward on this journey. That might be a continuous question for us in that God is asking the question, can you hear me now? And the response to the question is not so much in your response uh, in words, but your response in deeds. Help me somebody today. And then I remember talking about what is called the great commandment plus the great commission equals great results. Yeah, I know you said, Reverend, that's not what you said. Yeah, I've had a chance to think about it a little bit more. And I want to say it ain't excluded, but when I think about the great commandment and the great commission equals great result, that's epic. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yeah, epic. Meaning that when we combine the forces and combine the realities that God offers in the kingdom, it cannot be nothing more than an epic experience of God displaying his majesty and his glory. And how is it that God is able to display his majesty and his glory is when we submit to the great commandment and that is how much do we love God love the Lord thy God all your mind body heart and soul and love thy neighbor as thyself and on these two you can hang the whole law and then love your neighbor as yourself that's love the great commandment to love God that much and then the great commission, how he spoke to his disciples and how he prepared his disciples, how he exposed his disciples to the understanding of what was required in the thereafter. The thereafter what, Reverend? Thereafter when he got up out of the grave and all of his preparation to meet with them, to teach them and to prepare them for ministry. Oh, yeah, that's... Oh. And so today I want to uh, introduce you or invite you to the text, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. And I know we've talked about the great commandment. We've talked about the great commission. Each of them together equals great results. Another way of saying this is what we see in an epic evolution, an epic redesign, an epic redefining moment, and all that we can see launching into the future of what God has in store for the church in the kingdom of God. Pray for me. Pray for me. So today has to do with 
the great confession. The great confession. I've asked uh, questions, or at least this week, I thought to put on the marquee board as members of our church drive by paying attention to Second Baptist Church, 5100 West 100 Road, although the doors have been shut. Eh, but the doors to God's heart is always open. And the question on the marquee board is, what is the church? And I think that's a very relevant question today. What is the church? And on some Facebook post upload, I indicated in asking the question, how long? Not long. And so I'll leave it at that. And I want to address it as we proceed today uh, in this uh, preaching moment. And then secondly, there is another medley of scriptures that I want to uh, grab or pull and use as illustration, coupled with Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. I want to look at Lucan's account, the gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 45 through 49. And it is my desire to answer the question about what is the church? And anyone would want to know, well, when are the doors are going to be opened back up? But when are they going to open again? And my response, how long? Not long. Indulge me. And what I have discovered in this Matthew's account a revisitation of the scripture as we all are familiar. And it's interesting how the two uh, gospels of Matthew and Luke's gospel uh, offers some illustration or relevance to the idea of then what is the church. Uh, we have been fundamentally and historically, uh, uh, it's a shift. And what we have been accustomed to all along up to pre-corona has been a conglomerate of many other traditional activities that has uh, gain footage in the church as we used to know it. And now God, uh, perhaps, has given us the opportunity to reevaluate the relevance of our ministry. I know, I know, I've had members asking me, pastor, when we going to come back to church? And my response is, I don't know. But for me, a few weeks ago, I must confess that I had some idea that we would soon be coming back and it wouldn't be that much of a problem when we comply with the rules that have been extended from CDC and local authorities and in compliance with social distancing. I felt like it was achievable and objective that we could do so. But might I add and admit today that I no longer feel the way I felt three weeks ago about returning to the church. Can I offer you or can I say or might I add to those who are listening? Yours truly is in no hurry to come back into this building. Now, I recognize that this has always been what we always have done, but perhaps or could it 
be that God has divinely intervened and perhaps some of the misnomer or the misunderstandings of some historical traditions that has been embedded in the church. And might this be a new opportunity in this new norm to reshape the ministry? according to what God's expectations were in the kingdom of God. And I know many of us are yet still baffled and we are wondering, God, how is it that you would allow something like this to shut the church doors down? And might I add, some have already opened back up to have to close again. It don't take a rocket scientist for me. I, I, I'm observing, I'm listening, and I'm aware that there are those excited. You are uh, un, at unrest about coming back. And when I think of the gravity of this pandemic, when I consider the propensity and the likelihood to pass it on to somebody else, my conclusional defense and position is I'm not looking forward to come back. In fact, I don't want it on my watch that I have been insistent to come back to this building for the sake of us having church as the way we used to know it. And, and I've been watching and I've been following the timeline. And I don't know what you've been seeing since Ash Wednesday, but I know for me, God has rearranged me. He's reshaped my thinking. He has exposed himself. He has given me snapshot and glimpses of where he is going in the kingdom. And I can't say I am 100% correct. Every faith person, a person of faith, when we feel like and believe that we've heard God's voice, there is it to ourselves. It's like something boiling on the inside. I, I've discovered that in the last 10 weeks. There are moments when I'm just boiling. It's like a volcanic eruption. And sometimes I don't know what to do with it. I'm finding it humanly uh, difficult to handle the divine revelation of what God has been showing me. I understand, Jeremiah. It's like fire. Shut up in my bones. And God is the one who is going to put the flame out. And I rest in him. And I'm glad that uh, all of the acceptable responses, however, not the one Jesus was looking for. Now, let's try it this way. He asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter jumps out front. And Peter now answers the question correctly. And on the basis of his response, now God proves and demonstrates that Peter is his choice for setting up in this new paradigm shift. The first 12 chapters of the book of Acts is attributed or belonged or the author, or the showcase, or the presupposition of the first 12 chapters in the book of Acts chapter 12 is Peter. Oh, help me somebody. Yo, Peter, can I, young folk use language, use urban ebonics. Can I just say this? Peter was a bad dude. Yeah, Peter was a bad boy. Peter had it going on. Peter was always uh, up front. Peter, uh, he loved the Lord, and the Lord knew he loved him. Even though he denied him, he betrayed him. But the Lord saw potential in Peter that Peter couldn't be the reflection in the kingdom of God that was to come, and he would lead the disciples. Peter was a bad boy. What do you mean, Reverend? Go to Acts. Uh, 
chapter 5. That's all. Acts chapter 5 started at verse number 1. You will discover that there are two characters by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Peter being the apostle. Peter ruling and setting up the church. Peter instrumental in not purporting what God has trained them to do. Acts chapter 5, you will see that book of Acts is the beginning of the church. Acts chapter 5 or Acts chapter 1 or Acts, you will know that, that there are two divisions. The first part of Acts is the uh, establishing of the church. And some are still wondering, how long? Not long. And then the second part is the expansion of the church. Oh, help me somebody. So there is clear relevance and clear understanding of how important Peter is in the kingdom. Because God uses Peter. He sets Peter up and out front and leading in this church establishment. And then ultimately as they move in ministry, the expansion of the, why, what was the need for the expansion? Persecution. But Peter defied all odds. Peter was a bad boy. And Ananias and Sapphira during the early church, it wasn't hard for them to release of their uh, personal belongings and their goods they would sell and bring to the church and lay it at the apostles' feet. It was all thing common. And when I look at what's really happening, I have noticed there have been instances. God is somehow showing me that some full of wisdom, full of discernment, and, and somehow it seemed like Peter gave him a chance to get it right. So, so Ananias, are you saying this all you had? And Ananias still stuck to his story. He said, yep. And Peter said, Ananias, why have you come up in here and lied about your, what you gave? Look, Ananias, you didn't have to be dishonest. It was yours in the first place. All you had to do was just decide what you were going to give. And even in conspiracy with his wife, Sapphira, it's interesting they didn't have them to go together. They separate them. But that's how the Spirit of God does. He has a way of separating you from people that don't mean you no good. Oh, help me somebody. It is here that I'm convinced that what we have always believed about the church has shifted. It's no longer here. And might I add, all of y'all, our vision statement, we don't have to rewrite them. All of our church constitutions, we're going to have to add some addendums because we can no longer move in the forward progression in this new norm. In this paradigm shift, carrying a lot of baggage, unnecessary stuff that we've been doing for a long time. And now God has left it to the apostles. He's given it to the pastors to now right the wrong, fix it. Fix it, pastor, for all pastors. You are in the greatest position and moment you will ever know. And I know everybody ain't going to like your leadership. Everybody don't understand why you make decisions of things that you used to do. And you don't feel that you've had a sufficient chance, an opportunity to evaluate the efficacy of that tradition that we have been entrenched to. Pastors, you got to stand up now. And I stop that to tell you that God has given you the power. God has given you his anointing. You are God's favor. You are God's choice. You are God's man and woman servant. As a leader, God has given you the authority and the power to fix it. Why? The text says, after Peter interpreted, who Jesus was, Jesus says, now I give you authority. I give you the keys to the kingdom. What else did he say, Reverend? Glad you asked. He says to the pastors, whatever you bound, oh God, 
Meaning, you have to look and consider all of the stuff that we used to be accustomed to. Is it, is it now viable? Is it relevant anymore? And what is it going to take to enhance and build the efficacy of God's ministry and the kingdom of God? God said, whatever you bind, meaning whatever choice or decision you make in the rearranging and the reshifting, in the paradigm shift, God said, I've given you the authority. And whatever you lose, I'll honor. In other words, whatever you sanction, God got your back. And when I look at the idea of 12 apostles, that God gave them the responsibility to evangelize in the church. And might I add, Peter started out up front and all of them, all of the disciples had their part. Oh, I'm trying to close this thing. I said I wasn't going to take long. But God, here it is. Now, not only Peter's a bad boy as it relates to dealing with Ananias and Sapphira. And if I didn't tell you, if you don't know the story, they dropped dead. And, and Jesus, and when they brought in his wife, she, couldn't, she, she upheld the story. And right after that, she dropped dead. The same folk that took Ananias out was waiting at the door to come and take her out. And they died and they buried them. Peter's a bad boy. Notice the text. There was a time when they were going to the temple. You do remember the one that stood at the gate called Beautiful. He was begging on. It was there when Peter and John was going through the gate temple. And there you remember this man asking for arm. And Peter, there he go again. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But that what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus of Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up. Get up. And walk. And Peter reaches over and lifts up the man, the crippled man. And the man began to shake a little bit. I'm sure from birth he has been lying there. From birth he didn't know what it meant to move. Lying there when Peter says silver and gold have I none. Can I just say your money don't mean a whole lot in the kingdom. I know we have a propensity or a likelihood to hold on to it. But can I tell you, it ain't yours. When we trust God that what he has given unto us to give back to the kingdom, God will multiply it. God will make a way out of no way. Don't be moved and fooled by the enemy and believing that you think you can hold on to your... Oh, God. It's not yours. It's the Lord's. Peter, bad boy, on his way to the temple. The, the text would suggest that there were other streets, other ways to get to the temple. And there were those who heard that Peter and their apostles was coming through. And they knew the power that resided in Peter. And they heard it was coming. I want to use my own imagination. They were walking up Broad Street in Richmond. They were walking. And as they moved by MCV Hospital, they heard Peter and John and the apostles walking on their way to the temple. They knew the power of Peter. They, it was, they, they, they said, here they come. They were bringing folks out of the hospital. In the beds, on mats. Some had limbs that, uh, uh, you know, a lack of limbs that might have had the arm taken off or the leg taken off or the feet taken off. They, they were uh, lying on the mat. They, there were those who had COVID-19 symptoms. Oh, God, help me. They were bringing them out along Broad Street. And Peter and the disciples, on their way to the temple, and they were lying folk on the sidewalk, on the side of the street. They knew if they could just get a glimpse of the apostles. And the Bible said, Peter just walked by. And many of them believed if they could just capture his shadow Woo! His shadow, Reverend? You, you mean that what is reflective when the sun is high? On a sunshiny day, that the shadow that is reflected on the ground, that if somebody just was in the presence and came under the shadow, the Bible said, I'm not making this up. They were here. Not some of them, them would. High blood pressure, those with diabetes, those with, huh. oh God help me, you do it. 
But they said that, oh, only thing Peter was doing, just walking by, and even his shadow, people were healed. Peter was a bad boy. That's why Jesus spent so much time elevating Peter. That's why Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Feed my lamb. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And my brothers and sisters, I got to go. So what is the church? The church is no longer as we knew it. But the church now is the ecclesia. The called out ones. That Jesus, when he talked to Peter, Peter, you got it right. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I mean, whatever demons or imps that come to tear you down, you don't have to worry about it. I got you. Just stand flat footed. Love the people, lead the people, and I will take care of everything else. Those have been asking the question, when we're coming back to church? I don't know. But I ain't in no hurry to come back. It's just too many uh, risk situations. I look at people, I go to different places. They ain't wearing no masks. They ain't got on the proper PPE. They all in bunched up together. And I said, some, it seems to me that that's all you value your life. COVID-19, I say again, will take you out. And if that's all you care about your life, to neglect and evade and avoid wearing and donning proper PPE and maintaining six feet apart with social distancing, if that's all you care about, why should I subject myself anywhere that I become a candidate for being infected. Oh God. I ain't even looking forward. I ain't in no hurry to come back. I can wait to a vaccine. And even then, I got to wait to see if it works. In fact, I'm doing just fine right now. God is making a way out of no way. And I never felt so empowered to do ministry before like I feel now. And I'm persuaded. I'm convinced that the authority that God has given me is going to be used to oh, make a difference in this new norm, in this paradigm shift. And I know it's some lonely rogues ahead, but that's all right. Anybody who oppose any ideas or suggestions for the betterment and the moving forward of the ministry, you don't have to take it up with me. Don't be mad at me. Take it up with God. And I'm convinced that the authority that he gave all of us pastors, that we got to use it. And we cannot be timid and frivolous and unaccountable to neglect such a great responsibility. How long? Not long. What is the church? The church are you and me. Where we used to come to church is no longer here. Now you get to reside in your home, in your bedroom, in your kitchen, in your den, with whatever you have on. You don't have to get up, get dressed, put on no makeup no more. You don't have to go to Walmart. You don't have to go to Macy's and pick out outfits and buy shoes and do your nails, get your hair did. The church is the ecclesia. I mean, it, look, it is a, the called out ones. You, you, you can't be called out if you're still in the church. So God has shut it down to enforce us or force us to now be the church. Might we have just gotten too much preaching, too much word, and now God want to test the validity of that word? Now you have to be the word that you have always sucked up and absorbed and didn't bear any fruit. Oh, God. All right. My time is up. I don't want to take no more of yours. I'm going to just end it right there. And I want to say for those of you that is looking forward and raining, revving up to come back to church, don't be in no hurry. You be the church that God has already made you to be. And when God get ready for us to come back up in here, we will be able to do that with a greater understanding.
with a greater purpose and view in mind and to have understanding of what our real role is in this now new norm, in this paradigm shift and how God now going to use us in the kingdom of God like he ain't never used us before. And I'm glad today that God is good and his mercy endure forever. Won't he do it? Yeah. Didn't he do it? Yes. He woke me up this morning. Yeah. He started me on my way. And I'm glad that the trouble don't last always. The Lord is speaking real loud. Yeah, and I hear him clear. And I'm standing on the promises of God. Yeah, Lord, I love you. And I know you love me. And yeah, you have entrusted me with the people you have called me to lead, the people you've called me to serve. And I'm glad for the privilege that I'm named in the ranks of the 12 pastors. You have called all of your pastors and you have set them over your people. Yeah, and I'm glad that he's all right. He has blessed me and I know he's going to bless you. Trouble don't last always, my brothers and sisters. Won't he do it? Didn't he do it? And I'm glad. I'm done. I want to extend the invitation to whosoever will. Let them come. Any man, woman, boy, girl, wherever you are, whether you are watching us on live screen or whether you're listening to us through teleconference, if you are not saved today, I wouldn't end this conversation without you making up your mind. If I was you, I would make up my mind that for Christ I live and for Christ I die. I may not have this opportunity tomorrow, but while it is yet day, because when nighttime comes, no man can work. If you would say and repeat after me, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I recognize that I need to be saved. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of John said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. What is the church? The church as you know it, it's no longer is. When are we going to get to go back? I don't know. How long? Not long. I want to suggest that not long is the activation and the existence of the church right now. Because you are the church. This building does not make you to be what God has called you to be. Now God, more than anything else, is saying, you've been in the church too long. Now it's time to come out of the church. It has to be because he done shut the doors down. And I ain't in no hurry to come back. I'll come back when he's ready for us to come back. How about you? Until then, rejoice in the Lord because he has all things in control. We all are but in his hand. He is that he is. I love him, don't you? And I love you. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Hopefully you will tune in to our Zoom midweek Bible study. The upload will continue at 12 noon and the 7 p.m. Zoom Bible study will continue to go forward. Will you join us for another word and opportunity to receive what thus saith the Lord. God bless you. Peace and love be multiplied. Pray for me. I'm doing the best I can to, 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 to narrow uh, the span of our time on Facebook Live. I got a lot of stuff that's going in my head, but I got to package it up in a way and with less time that I've been taking. And that's a very difficult thing to do. But if you pray for me, I believe we will be successful and God will do what God wants to do. Peace. Love you.